Hello, I'm Jim from the Royal Veterinary College London. We've been working with a group from Bristol, exploring whether flying birds might teach us a trick or two that could be used in aircraft design. I'm going to discuss two tricks, one mainly aerodynamic and the other one more mechanical. To start off the aerodynamics, here is Lily the barn owl flying towards us down a very dark corridor. She's about to go through a mist of helium bubbles. There you go, the lights turn on. She carries on to receive her food reward, and we get the reward of watching her wake in the motion of those bubbles. This time with the tawny owl Hector coming through, you can see that we can light those bubbles and have a very nice black background. And this really shows up the trailing vortices hanging there in the wake for really quite some time. Now with those nice bright bubbles, we can track them with multiple high speed cameras. So each bubble is about 0.3 millimeters across, and we're tracking about 20,000 of them here. They're filled with just the right amount of helium so to make them neutrally buoyant, which means that before the bird arrives, they're just hanging around in the air, and all the motions are down to the aerodynamics of the bird. Now, to go through some of the aerodynamics on display here, we can see that the bubbles are coded blue for down and red for up, and most of the field turns blue. This makes sense, because it is the accelerating mass of air downwards and the reaction to that that produces the aerodynamic lift that supports body weight. The regions of red are regions of upwash, and we're familiar with those because birds fly in V formations, and presumably there are some nice places you can fly to take advantage of these areas of upwash. So far, so conventional. Any aeroplane wing producing lift would produce a wake that looks quite like that. But what's remarkable is the extra pair of trailing vortices and the extra downwash produced by the tail. There you go, see that patch of blue just underneath the tail. Now, this strikes us as odd, remarkable, we weren't expecting it, because we're familiar with conven conventional aircraft design, or uh, as demonstrated by a glider here. And what this glider and many conventional aircraft uh, has is wings and tail set at quite different angles, such that the tail actually produces a downforce. This might strike you as odd because obviously then the main wing has to produce even more lift to support the body weight. And with lift comes drag. And with drag either comes a steeper glide angle or the, the requirement to burn more fuel to keep on in a horizontal line. Why does it do it? Because it results in a really neat aerodynamic trick. And that is of passive stability. So a glider like this that's bumped slightly up automatically levels off. The trick worth works both ways. If it's bumped slightly down, it automatically levels off again. And this is important for a glider where there's no pilot controlling it. And it also makes aircraft very, very much easier to fly. But the bird here is doing quite the opposite. It is producing strong positive lift uh, on its tail, which you can see because there's a downwash produced by the tail. And it turns out that at the sizes and speeds of birds, this is really important when it comes to minimizing the drag of, uh, of the whole bird. But it does mean that in aerodynamic passive terms, it is very, very unstable. Presumably the bird can get away with this uh, aerodynamic instability because it's got active sensors, it's got an active brain, and it's got muscles continuously uh, twitching uh, to, to cope with the, the, the stability issue. Now, if we take this lesson and apply it to small bird scale aircraft, now that we have active sensors and rapid processors and small lightweight actuators or motors, perhaps it is now time for the, the, the tails of these small aircraft to be doing their share of weight support in order to minimize drag and to cope with the, the stability issues with more active means. So far, we've been talking about uh, flight in nice still air, partly because uh, that helps with a bubble trick. But of course, where birds really excel is in coping with real world conditions. This is a golden eagle Tilly with a camera a mountain on, on her back and she's soaring over a mountain in Scotland. And you can see she's keeping a good eye on things on the ground, and she's being blustered about, and her wings are doing all sorts of things uh, to, to stabilize her. Taking this sort of thing into the lab, we have again Lily the barn owl, this time gliding over some industrial fans. 
Now, after some care careful experimentation, we find that uh, Lily can actually cope with a very, very strong upgust. The upgust here is about the same speed as her forward flight speed. So that's seven or eight meters a second. Now, around Lily, as she goes uh, over the, the, those fans, we've got several uh, pairs of high-speed cameras uh, from which we can uh, get this, the point clouds like this. So we can measure the, the shape of the surface. And we can see how the surface changes as she's hit by the gust. This allows us to start to, to calculate both the aerodynamic and the mechanical implications. And you can see what's happening largely here. Here comes Lily. She's hit by a strong upgust. And look, the wings are flown up. But her face, her eyes, keep on pretty much in a straight line. There you go. Watch how stable her head is. So you could imagine that as a form of stability, a, 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 a form of suspension between wings and body. Of course, the concept of suspension between wings and body is not a new one. This is a patent from about 1935. And there are things here that would be familiar uh, uh, it, from your car suspension. We've got springs and dash pots or dampers. And the idea is that a bumpy air is, is, is uh, not felt by, by the passenger. But this is very much missing the tricks that we can learn from Lily. To explain the tricks, here is my, my wooden model. It's just three planks bolted together with, with hin uh, simple hinges between the body and the wings and held together with bunges at the base. Now, watch the response to, an, uh, to the impulses. So I'm applying what could be a push from a gust. If it happens here, near the wing uh, hinge or shoulder, the body goes up. That makes sense. If the bump happens here at the wing tips, then the body goes down. Meaning that there is some point in between where, when there's a bump, the wing moves, but the body doesn't. Now, I can explain this with simple mechanics. If an impulse happens at exactly the right point, the combination of accelerating the wing up and accelerating the wing around cancel each other up, uh, can cancel each other out. So that the impulse here isn't felt at all by the, uh, by the hinge. Now, we're familiar with this point. It's a sweet spot on a, on a baseball bat. If I hit the ball at exactly the right point, then I end up feeling no jolt at all on my hands. So, let's take a couple of principles here. One is to um, avoid the, the, the bump from the air pushing the body up, the wings actually have to have some mass. Uh, where I say massive wings here, I don't mean enormous wings, I mean the wings actually have to have mass. And then the impulse from the centre of lift, from the gust, has to be located somewhere near the centre of percussion, this, this mass term. And the second principle is the, the, the connection between the, the wings and the body, the, the, the hinge, the, the, this connection needs to be uh, able to, to support the body weight when it's just gliding along, but it's got to allow the wing to, to lift up when it's hit by the gust. Now, it turns out that while you can calculate exactly what these properties should be, it doesn't matter that much if you don't mind getting a, a fairly good uh, outcome. So here's just a simple uh, model glider with a bit more mass uh, on the wings. And on the left, we've got the control where the wings are still uh, locked to the, the body or the fuselage. And you can see that when it meets the uh, updraft, it's kicked up a long way. But on the right, we've got uh, the, the flexible wing hinge and the wings go up. And you get very barn owl like responses from a very simple manipulation. Now, this could easily be applied to, 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 to small aircraft and would be very useful for those aircraft that need to fly slowly in blustery conditions, perhaps uh, carrying a camera or delivering your parcel uh, or, or, or picking up supplies. It's very useful to be able to fly slowly and then have your, your, your fuselage carry on a straight line despite the bumps in the air. So to answer the question of whether planes would be better if they were more like birds, well, in some cases we believe yes. But perhaps especially in those cases where we're asking planes now to operate at sizes and speeds that birds operate at, and in some ways do very bird-like things. I shall finish by uh, 
pointing out the, the collaborations involved, acknowledging our, our, our funding sources, and giving a special thanks to Lloyd and Rose Buck and their beautiful birds. <laughs>